The festival features various events, including a curated and artistically designed science exhibition, a science congress, hands-on workshops, street installations, citizen science activities, and science-infused cultural programs. With an expected footfall of over 1 million people, including students, the scientific community, and the general public, GSF, GSFK is expect, expected to become Asia's biggest curated science festival. Now, I welcome all the dignitaries to the dais. Shyam Beers, Head of Hospitality Team, GSFK, for the welcome speech. Welcome to another session of Kerala Talk on Science Fest, Kerala Science Festival of Kerala. So, it's my utmost delight uh, welcome all of you to this uh, prestigious program. Today we have uh, our guest, Ms. Kali Murri, Member of Parliament from Tutukudi Constituency. She's a well-known poet, politician. Am I audible? Yeah. She's a, a well-known poet, politician, and a public figure. So we are uh, very proud and esteemed to have her for this program, so we are uh, we are trying we are, we are having an earnest attempt to bridge the gap between science, art, and literature here. So I think uh, she will definitely have her beautiful insights for us. I cordially welcome Ms. Kalimuri MP to this program. Thank you. Secondly. Uh, from the part of the organizing team, we have uh, Dr. Vaishakan Thambi, who is the curator for the uh, science exhibition and the science festival here. I cordially invite him for the program. <laughs> and uh, next, uh, the audience here, who came from different colleges of the city and uh, Trivandrum. Also, we have the media people here. Uh, and. Uh, other organizing team members and our friends, I welcome all of you to the program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, it's time to welcome Dr. Vaishagan Thambi. Dr. Vaishagan Thambi is the curator and convener of GSFK Science Committee. He is an assistant professor of physics in Mahatma Gandhi College, Tiruvannadavaram and has been active in science popularization for more than a decade. He's an author of six popular science books and a speaker who has delivered science talks in and outside India. He holds a PhD in material science from National Institute for Interdisciplinary Science and Technology, Tiruvannadapuram. I welcome Dr. Vaishagan Thambi, sir, for the presidential address. Respected Chief Guest of the Day, Sri Madhika Nimari, and my friend and fellow organizer of Global Science Festival, Shyam on Dais, and we have the additional Prayer Secretary to the Honorable Chief Minister of Kerala, Sri Major Dinesh Bhaskar here, and all dignitaries of this dais, friends. What you have just heard is just a welcome. It is. It was for the, just a formality sake. I'm not someone who has to be welcome to this. In fact, I'm personally very happy and on, feel honored to be present, standing here and acting as a chairperson to this function. As you have already been introduced to Global Science Festival, Kerala in unique, is unique in many senses. It blends art and science for the better communication of both. And while we are here, the curated exhibition part, which is the largest of the all components Global Science Festival Kerala has. It is going to be open to the public in 20th of this month. It is 
just day after tomorrow. And while at this juncture, I feel immense happy to be here. And personally, as part of the uh, organizing team, I'm feel, we are feeling very privileged to be hosting Srimadhi Kanimari on this dais. And I am sure that all of you might be extremely happy to listen to her. I'm, I'm not the person to be listened to, be listened to here. But I would like to uh, mention, or I would like to uh, express my feelings while we are going to listen to her. Global Science Festival Kerala has been conceived as a, as an, as a unique event in a society where there is a prevalent idea that science and arts are some two different, extremely different domains that has nothing in common or no give and take between each other. But that is actually a misconception about the public. Maybe that misconception is even shared by people who are actively involved in science and arts. Most of the time arts people think that science is not, it doesn't belong to them and science people think arts does not belong to them. The, the latter, the former part is more serious. And while uh, collaborating with many talented artists during the uh, organization of this program, I have personally witnessed that many of the people who are very good act artists think that science does not belong to them. They have no business in science. But I'm pretty sure that they have changed their opinion because they are very well aware of the things happening here. They know that science is something that we can enjoy. And when we hear poetry being discussed in public, when we hear economics being discussed in public, when we hear politics being discussed in public, we feel that those are all things that are relevant to the public, that are things that should be discussed in public. But when we talk about, say, gravity on a public speech, we are not that comfortable because we think that some classroom discussion is going on. It is not something that belongs to the public domain discussions. That is the attitude that we are trying to change. In mathematics, there is a word, mathematical beauty. And mathematics is conventionally considered as a subject that is frightening to many of us. Then how can something be beautiful and frightening at the same time? But there is a word, mathematical beauty. Mathematicians find beauty in some equations. Because there is an element of beauty there. There is something that can be enjoyed, that can give you an experience of happiness or pleasure. So science does offer such an opportunity. And now we have Srimadhi Kanimari here. It is no need to introduce her as a politician because we know she is. But lesser known is that she's a poet, she's a journalist, she's an activist for many reasons, many causes including gender rights and many, many other things. So she's, when she is here and she's about to address you, I'm personally trying to highlight the importance and how, how we find it very relevant and how we find, our, find ourselves uh, privileged to have her. When she is about to, about to talk about the subject poetry of science, there is a marvelous blend of experience and knowledge. If you have looked at the tagline of GSFK, it says, known and to be known. It is wrong to assume that scientists are a group of people who are privileged enough to have access to the knowledge about the universe and the common public are supposed to listen, receive from them and no dialogue. You just listen to what the scientists say and just note, okay, no. There are things that are already known. There are things that are known with absolute clarity, but there are things that are not known to that level of clarity. There are some things that are not known to us. So we need to acknowledge what is there. We need to acknowledge what is yet to be known. That only opens doors to the journey of scientific explorations. Because if everything is known, there is no moving forward. So science opens those possibilities. And if, as GSFK opens to the public, I'm sure the people are going to realize there is an experience part of science and there is knowledge being presented, not technological innovations. So I'm not taking much of this time because I'm not the person that you are supposed to listen to. And with this brief remarks, uh, I would, once again, I would like to express my happiness in being here as part of this function. And now I request our anchor to introduce our chief guest uh, to you before her 
uh, before inviting her to deliver her speech. Please, thank you. Thank you, sir. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to stand before you, to, before you today to introduce a remar remarkable individual who is a poet, writer, journalist, and of course, a well-known political figure, the distinguished Kanimuri Karunanithi. She is a member of parliament representing Tutukudi constituency in the Lok Sabha. Kanimuri's journey goes beyond the political arena. It delves into the realms of literature, poetry, and journalism. A published author and poet, her literary works have been translated into English, Malayalam, Telugu, and Kannada, creating a bridge that connects hearts and minds across diverse cultures. She was the sub-editor for the Hindu. Kanimuri has worked on a production titled Silpadigaram, a woman of substance, based on a Tamil ep epic of the same name with Bombay Jayashri. She is a beacon of social change, actively engaging in the organization of women empowerment programs. Her advocacy for the rights and well-being of differently abled individuals and the transgender community reflects a compassionate spirit dedicated to inclusivity and equality. As we gather here today, let us welcome Kanimuri Karunanithi with the respect and admiration befitting a leader, poet, journalist, and advocate for social change. It is with great anticipation that we look forward to the insights and wisdom she will share today. With great pleasure, I welcome Kanimuri Karunanithi ma'am for the lecture. Vanakam. It's a great pleasure and opportunity to be here at the Global Science Festival of Kerala, a one month long festival. I don't think any other state in India is doing this, celebrating science, celebrating scientists, celebrating the students who are interested in science and celebrating art and culture along with science. I think it is an amazing initiative and I would once again like to congratulate the government of Kerala for organizing <laughs> this event and I was very happy to know that it is going to become the largest in Asia. So congratulations to all of you who have been part of it and uh, once again, my heartfelt congratulations, Vartikal. And uh, I, it's a pleasure to share the dais with Mr. Sham, who introduced the program. And uh, of course, uh, when they introduced Mr. Thambi, I got a little more nervous because he's got so many accomplishments in the field of science. And I'm as far away as possible from science. And uh, especially when the CM's office and Mr. Dinesh called me and said, uh, you, he wanted me to come and address um, this conference and uh, talk about science. I thought he was joking. I said, me, uh, in a science, uh, festival. I mean, I really could not understand because I wanted, after my 10th, I wanted to keep away as far as I could from science. So I chose economics and uh, now in politics. So, uh, you know, I haven't had uh, much engagements uh, with science actually and especially, you know, in today's circumstances. When your Prime Minister goes to a conference of uh, doctors, especially they are uh, specialists in surgery, and he says that we had plastic surgery in the Vedic ages. Plastic surgery in the Vedic ages because when Shiva cut away the neck of Parvati's first child, 
Shiva replaced it with a head of an elephant. You can all think about the head size of the he uh, elephant head and a child. But then the Prime Minister says they were able to do plastic surgery then. And two professionals who actually you know, worked for 100 years in a span of 15 years to become what they are. That is what the medical profession demands. And then once in, my pa when, once in parliament, when there was a debate going on, one of the senior members, and uh, sorry to say, I think he's uh, from the IPS or the IAS cadre, and please nobody get insulted. He got up and said that we've all descended from the rishis. You know, peop uh, theory of evolution is wrong. We actually descended from the rishis. Then I got up and I said, uh, you might have descended from the rishis, but we are sadly sudras, we descended only from the monkeys. So after listening to all this, then I, when they call me for this science fest, then I decided, as not as a scientist or not as a person who is an expert on science, but as a citizen of this country, I have a duty to be here. Because you hear such things. And the Constitution, Article 51A of, A of the Constitution says, it is a duty of every citizen to ensure and spread scientific temper in this country. But unfortunately, this country is moving away as far as possible from the scientific temper. This country today is going back to the textbooks and removing the theory of evolution from it. Today, this country is tampering with the syllabus. Today, this country is changing science into mythology and mythology into science. So it is time that all of us talk, all of us with opinions, all of us who want to see a change and all of us who believe in scientific temperament and social justice have to speak. Actually, the Nobel laureate Ada E. Yonath says, science is the literature of nature. Yes, science is the way nature speaks to us, the way nature communicates with us. And the beauty of science is it's not stagnant. And it humbles you. It is much beyond what you can decipher, what you can understand. I think the greatest lesson we were taught recently was the COVID pandemic. Because humanity was at one point where we thought we had discovered, of course, not for the common uh, cold. We, had, we haven't found how to resolve that uh, virus. But uh, other than that, nearly everything, every disease we had conquered and uh, science was uh, artificial intelligence and uh, science was speaking and uh, there was nothing the human race could not achieve. And then comes the pandemic. And it shows us how small we are. It shows us how helpless science, humanity, doctors, research is in front of nature. It humbles us. And this is what our philosophers our poets have always been talking about. In Tamil, there's a saying, Katradu kaimannalavu, kalladadu kadalalavu. What you've learned fits your palm. What you don't know is as big as the oceans. So the COVID and now the climate change, it's teaching us lessons unfortunately, which we are refusing to learn. 
People lived with nature. People loved nature. You talk about the Sangam poems. They worshipped nature. They lived with nature. Their life was part and parcel of nature. But today, our lifestyle has become something which destroys nature, which takes away from nature, which is ensuring that nature has no part in our lives. I mean, just not Kerala. Recently in Tamil Nadu, in Chennai, in my own constituency, we've never heard, have you ever heard of a storm suddenly deciding to stop? Stop in a city? You know, like it's just getting, uh, waiting to have a coffee and then continue its journey. It stopped in Chennai. It slowed down in Chennai. And nobody knows why. Same thing in Tutukudi. We, we are a water, rain-starved district. In one day, we had rains of 93 centimeters. And I don't think, I'm sure you all know, that this is not going to be a one-time thing. Not here, not, not in Tamil Nadu, not in Kerala, not in any part of the world. But we do not understand the lessons nature wants to teach us through science, through poetry, through philosophy. Because one does not exist without the other. We have to. And Rachel Carson says science is a way of looking at the world with a child's wonder and a poet's eye. We wonder at everything around us. And that is what makes science what it is. If you do not have questions, you do not have why, how, nothing would have been discovered. If people did not ask these questions, if people did not want to find solutions, if people did not say, I am not going to accept this, I'm going to change this. If people did not say, is there a different way of doing it, doing it better? And if people did not say, why should I accept this? Nothing would have changed in this world. We can talk about social justice, we can talk about science, we can talk about philosophy, we can talk about uh, um, humanity, you can talk about democracy, you can talk about anything in this world. There is no change when we do not ask these questions. And I think art, culture, poetry are the spaces where these questions are first asked. A poet might not ask questions in a scientific way. There's my favorite Siddha, Siddhar, po there's a tradition of Siddhar poetry in Tamil. Uh, and I think uh, most, they, they lived uh, from 2000, 2000 years ago. And uh, one of my favorite uh, Siddhas is Sivavakir. Nearly 2000 years ago, he asks, Yelimbu tolle vandu ilakkam ittirikkido jadi ingra ilakku. Adavadu, it means that is your skin and bone imprinted with your caste? What is caste? It is meaningless. Many of his poems question the food. Today, we are stamped as something because we eat a particular kind of food, we wear a particular kind of clothes. But 2,000 years ago, our poets from this country questioned that. He said, what is wrong in eating meat? You're talking about Veda. When you're sick, will Veda come, Vedas come and help you? It's another human being who has to come and help you. So these questions were asked by our poets, by our thinkers. And today, science is answering it. And one of his poems, he says, he asks, what is the difference between what comes between the dog and me? Today, science says that we are 
of course, we are closer to the, I think uh, we share 90% of uh, our DNA with the cats and slightly less than that with the dogs. And of course, with the chimpanzees, 98% of our DNA is shared with the chimpanzees. So when 98% of your chim uh, DNA is shared with the chimpanzees, what meaning does race or caste have? Don't you think it's, it's a big joke? When we talk about, I belong to this particular caste, my daughter cannot get married, my son cannot get married, I'll kill them. If they break these traditions and get married. You are related to the dog, the cat, the chimpanzee. And what right do you have to talk about caste system, to talk about race? These questions have been this is the tradition of India. These questions are the tradition of India. This is what India is. It always questioned. It questioned through our art, it questioned through our poetry, it questioned through our literature. We never accepted. Even when it was God and believers of God had the guts to question God. And our tradition always celebrated God as a friend. Our tradition celebrated God as a lover, as a husband. And some of Bharadiyar's poems call Krishna as his slave, his worker. Kannan yen sevagan. But these questions, this joy, this celebration, of nature, of uh, the world, of our religion, today has been taken away from us. And we should understand without science, we will not be sitting here today unless the buses came. The caste system in villages, in rural India, even in cities couldn't have been broken. Unless cinema came, when you go to the theater, when you buy tickets, you cannot decide who sits next to you. In the bus, yes, there were times even that had to be faced. But slowly, when the buses came, when science came, that changed. In the cinema theaters, you could not say, I won't sit next to you, I will not. What is your caste? What is your community? Which religion do you belong to? So that changed. So all the human aspirations, all the dreams, whether it's a dream of leaders like philosophers like Ayan Kali or Periyar, today we are able to fulfill it. Today we are able to see it becoming part of our lives. Today it has changed lives is because science has helped us. Science has stood by us. Science has taken us to where we are and where we should be. But unfortunately, science is a double-edged sword. You can use it like the atom. You can use it to help to make society, to build society to nourish society, to encourage society, to make it much more cherishable and much more humane. And you can use it to destroy. Today, when we look at technology, when we look at social media, what does it do? Yes. It gives us so much information. It brings the whole world into our hands. Once when uh, uh, Dr. Shivan, our great scientist, had come to my constituencies to meet some students, and he had an interaction with the students. And uh, one of the students asked him, he's 
Mr. Shivan is from a very small, Professor Shivan is from a very small uh, village in Kanyakumari. So when a student got up and asked him, why, how, wh what made you become a scientist? So uh, he answered, Mr. Shivan said, I never wanted to become a scientist. I didn't know what a scientist was. My greatest dream was to become the headmaster of the school opposite to my house. Because that is the world I knew. The most respected man in my village was that headmaster, and the school was only till fifth or sixth. So he, the headmaster of that school was the most respected person, and that is what I wanted to become. Somehow I ended up in college, and then the, my professors asked me to go to Bangalore for this interview, and I went there and I got through. Once I got into this course, I realized I had a passion for it. I, I really found it so interesting and it, so intriguing, and I was drawn into it. But today, your dreams don't have to stop with your uh, village headmasters because you know what the world is. You know what are the possibilities. But there are many girls here. Can you put out an opinion in social media? It includes me also. Uh, put out an opinion in social media and not be trolled. journalists, politicians, girl, young girls with opinions which they would like to share, poets, writers, uh, students, boys, all of them are trolled, bashed in the social media. And social media is used to spread fake news, wrong science. I'm sure you must be seeing Today also we were talking about uh, cows uh, which are able to breathe in oxygen and breathe out oxygen. I'm sure you must have seen that in social media. And of course, uh, Valentine's Day became, you know, cow hugging day and the cows taught people a lesson also. It uh, made sure uh, they landed in, uh, you know, wherever they had to land. So this is what social media is doing today, spreading false information. So it can be a double-edged weapon. And to understand where we have to stop and think, we need values. We need ideology. We need a belief system. We need to have faith in humanity, in the human race. We need to have love not discrimination, not hate. Religion is a personal thing. What you believe is none of my business. Unless it is hurting somebody else, yes, I can tell you. Language is something very precious to me. Tamil is very precious to me. Malayalam is precious to me. you. Nobody has a right to tell me what I have to learn. Nobody has a right to say that something else is more important than your own language. That right, that self-respect, that comes from literature, culture, poetry, our value system, our heritage, and our own identities, and faith in social justice. Because like Martin Luther King said, if there is no justice somewhere, then there can be no justice anywhere. You cannot accept injustice in some place, in some form, and say it is okay. And we cannot say that in other places we have it. It will spill over, it will spread, it will take away. We have to understand that. But today, when we talk about science to some people, there's one interesting anecdote. When somebody asked, a journalist asked Einstein, 
can you explain the theory of relativity to me but in a very 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 layman's uh, you know way of saying it uh, because i don't know uh, you know how to understand it so he asked the journalist can you explain how to fry an egg so this guy says that's the easiest thing why not i can explain to you but then again he says that on one with one condition you must assume that i don't know what an egg is what a frying pan is what oil is now tell me how to fry an egg today people look at science that way today they want to take away science from the children they want to take away the learning what an egg is what an frying pan is what an oil is and what of what is food and then they bring something else to substitute that's what they substitute with will not just take away the knowledge of science but it will take away your lives it will take away the education which you've been able to achieve today it will take away the opportunities our forefathers have fought so much to get for us it will take away gender justice it will take away laws it will take away social justice self respect our identities so when they take away science they take away life from us they take away values from us they take away the right to live from us the right to live is the way we want to live not live a life which somebody else decides for us the choice of life the choice of how to live so we should understand that our values our ideology the poetry the culture what we believe we are and what we believe we should be is all interlinked our philosophers wanted to see a world where everybody was equal was everybody uh, could get equal opportunities where everybody had choices where everybody could get justice and we should remember when science is taken away from us we lose every one of this dream which people had fought for starting from mahatma gandhi to mahatma ayankali to periyar to all the leaders who fought for social justice and the faith and belief and trust we have in what is india cannot be taken away from us so science should not be taken away from us thank you and it was a pleasure meeting you all and speaking to you. now we will be having a question and session those who wish to ask but have you said that what we known up to now is only a speck a drop the unknown is an ocean so how science can traverse such a broad ocean it to be explored what is your uh, tips to explore such unexplored areas then another point you raised is even so we are sharing 
Nandi ate jeans with a dog or a cat. Some people among emit as are treated as dogs and cats. Some people emit as in northern part, not in Kerala, are treated still as dogs and cats. Even so, we share ninety-eight percent of yeah. our genome genes. Some people, what? What did you say? Some people. No, you, you just mentioned that. Yeah, we uh, share. We yeah. share ninety-eight percent of. Ninety-eight uh, with the chimpanzee. Ah, uh, uh, percent with the uh, dogs and cats. Uh. Even so, not in Kerala, but elsewhere, still now they are t the people are treated as just like dogs and cats. In in northern India, not in Kerala. What is your take on it? First one was on uh, how to. I think uh, your first question is as science has come I mean a long way, and I don't think uh, it'll ever be able to reach its optimum. We are. I think that is the wonder and beauty of the universe and nature and the world. So we are going, going to keep discovering things and we are going to, you know, keep uh, researching and finding out, uh, you know, and learning every day. So I think that is the beauty of science, that something new comes up. And uh, treating people badly, I don't think, uh, you know, it's just one part of uh, India or one part of the world. Uh, even today, I mean... Um, there are uh, economic slaves, uh, you know, much more than what we would like to think. Uh, there is human trafficking. There are, uh, you know, there is racism. So, uh, uh, and of course, caste system and uh, the way women are treated, uh, gender biases. I, I mean, I think we should work towards changing that. We cannot say that... Uh, you know, we are better off or somebody, in some parts only it happens. I, I think uh, these happen everywhere in, you know, a different scale. Uh, Kerala might definitely be better, but I'm sure uh, this is what social justice is and uh, that is what we have to work towards. Thank you. Anyone else? Hello, ma'am. I have a uh, rather, it's a rather political question. And we have a CSR exhibition, National Science Exhibition happening in uh, Faisabad. And uh, they decided to include a small scale of Ram uh, temple. They are building right now into the science exhibition. And the, uh, the experts in that field is uh, backing up. There is some scientific, uh, you know, uh, voodoo in that. Ex, uh, model and they are kind of promoting it. As I, um, the pers um, representative of people, how would you uh, challenge that or uh, what is your opinion about that and uh, uh, how will you uh, respond to that? Thank you. No, like uh, I said, I think religion is a very personal thing. We care, nobody has a right to bring it into uh, you know, uh, into the curriculum or uh, into educational syllabuses or uh, into politics. So, uh, I mean, we are trying. I, I mean, there are many people in this country trying to change that. And uh, hopefully, we will be able to change that. And uh, I think it's, it's in all our hands. It's just not you know, uh, a political party's uh, responsibility. I think it's much more than that. It is the responsibility of the student community, everybody who wants to see India as a secular nation. Uh, it is all our responsibilities to stand up against that, raise our voices and fight. Thank you. Hello, ma'am. So, uh, just that we all heard that uh, this Indian Science Congress which might not happen due to the uh, Central Science and Technology Department fund insufficiency and all. So at the same time, they are allowing funds for research on cow dung and you know uh, a river that might not even exist. 
So what's your take on that? My take on that is that it's very sad. And uh, when I say that, uh, like this, uh, things like this and uh, people being forced with, uh, you know, uh, belief systems which are against science. Hi, ma'am. Myself, Malaga from Digital University, Kerala. So I have to ask about the, uh, like in this uh, future and this present era, there is artificial in intelligence. So people are using this artificial intelligence for making poems and creating stories and like they're not using their human creativity for making these poems and all. So what is your opinion on that? How will this end in the future? See, um I think Elon Musk also recently said, you know, artificial intelligence is going to be the most dangerous thing. But uh, we cannot stop technology. You cannot stop uh, science. You cannot stop development. So we have to find ways, uh, you know, to stop uh, it from being used, uh, you know, uh, in wrong ways or, uh, you know, in ways where uh, people will be threatened uh, or uh, misused. So we have to look at ways to do that. Uh, unfortunately, even uh, cyber violence, we haven't come to you know, some way of stopping it. But hope that uh, we will be able to do that. But uh, stopping artificial intelligence or uh, you know, fighting against that is not going to uh, you know, happen because it, might, it I definitely will have its uh, benefits too. But I think the most important thing is, as we are developing uh, artificial intelligence, if we can also think of, you know, checks and balances, uh, it would be really good. Uh, we, we read a lot of uh, science fiction, you know, we were millennials, but uh, so, uh, we were influenced a lot by the poetry and also, you know, uh, books from H.G. Wells or uh, Jacob Perlman and people like that, old Soviet books. And uh, <coughs> we had a lot of uh, science publications and, of course, uh, programs and events like Science Festival. So how relevant these kind of festivals like Global Science Festival or, you know, taking science to people at this era? So uh, what do you think about it? Like how effective and how relevant these kind of festivals are. Festivals. Yes, please. Somebody just asked me this question, uh, you know, uh, money is going to research on cow dung and uh, a river which uh, doesn't exist. So I think science festivals like this will make students and people understand what science is and what science is not. So that way, I think this is a very, very, very relevant festival. And I think we should take it all over India. Hi, ma'am. Ma'am, do you think the intersection of um, poetry, politics, and science could be beneficial in having or dealing with the societal issues that are coming up? Definitely, I think, uh, um, I mean, in Tamil Nadu and in Kerala especially, uh, art, literature have been part of uh, politics. Uh, we've never been able to take away, um, you know, all your poets uh, had uh, revolutionary thoughts and uh, there are many poets, uh, even today, that who write about, uh, you know, very strong political views. And uh, same way in Tamil Nadu also, like uh, when you talk about the Dravidian movement, we used uh, uh, theatre, we used cinema, we used to use poetry, fiction, everything to, uh, you know, talk about uh, our values, our ideologies. So I don't think, uh, and this is not just here, in many countries, uh, you know, uh, art, literature, uh, poetry, um, you know, art uh, in many forms uh, have been part of the political uh, narrative. 
it's it's the best way to reach people you know just uh, beyond talking to them uh, it's another beautiful way to reach people is uh, uh, through our uh, uh, art and uh, literature but uh, what message you're taking is science so politics can not go away from to take its message it needs the art culture print everything and the message which politics should give is science unfortunately in uh, we see that in many places the message is moving away from science and uh, that will definitely be a downfall of humanity so i think these three things are a integral part of politics thank you hi ma'am i'm atira i wanted to ask a question not about science or politics it's on poetry so how has your father karunanandi sir uh, impacted and molded your journey as a poet father modern uh, how has your father influenced you Uh, your journey as a poet um my father uh, um yes his ideologies uh, have always influenced me the ideologies he believed in the dravidian ideology periyar uh, th- that is what the core of me is today so anything i write anything i say anything i speak comes from that so uh, it is my father who gave me that uh, environment that's uh, the, the the conversations and uh, the understanding of uh, social justice reservation or uh, you know uh, talking against caste system or uh, i'm an atheist like him and even that understanding i think uh, comes from him thank you any more question uh, i am going to ask something about uh, the relation about the science and poetry uh, in uh, science heart is a, in in science heart is a very important organ of human body but uh, as far as poet 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 concern uh, heart is something uh, related to uh, they concern heart as a emotional organ and uh, in malayalam there is a poem uh, named kuttipuram palam uh, and that poem describes about, about the village after uh, a, a new bridge is built built in a village uh, the village lost its beauty poets says like that actually uh, after after the after building that bridge it was very useful to the people that was the reality uh, while you write something as a poet while you write something how you overcome the contra uh, contra con- this contradictory relation between science and imagination how how you overcome that uh, problem that is my question see when you do build a bridge uh, i definitely think uh, you take away from nature like uh, but th- not all bridges are isos if there is a marshland and if you're going to build uh, extend a port there or uh, you know br- build high rise buildings it's just not going to uh, be an eyesore like a poet say you, your po- the po- uh, poem you were quoting says that you know the beauty went off this is going to threaten lives of people if you have a flood the flood is never going to find place to flow out so when you you uh, choose a land i mean now we understand maybe people did it you know in those days where they thought development was the most important thing so uh, forests uh, marshlands or nothing mattered it's just industries and development and employment and all that but today we understand that uh, 
we have to preserve nature we have to uh, you know hold it as precious but i don't think there's such a contradiction uh, between poetry and science uh, because the heart you talk about in poetry is not actually the heart you talk about in uh, science it's uh, the uh, the poor heart you talk about doesn't beat and it doesn't have blood flowing around it or anything the heart you talk about it is in the mind so i don't think there's uh, a big contradiction in that i mean uh, i understand that uh, we think there is a grandmother in the moon and uh, she tells us stories and uh, on our lonely nights we can talk to her but uh, we still understand that uh, it's it's um, uh, poetry it's it's my imagination and in my uh, seeking for a companion and uh, so, uh, of course somebody went and landed over there so that we understand that there is a difference and uh, only thing is i should not say this is the truth when i say this the grandmother was talking to me and uh, you know her words flowed like uh, you know the the melted uh, silver and came to me i cannot say that is the truth uh, unfortunately people are saying that is the truth today any more question Hello ma'am would you be able to recite a poem for the evening <laughs> actually um, maybe i'll read a poem i hope you don't want my poem this is a poem by Uh, Rebecca Elson an astronomer let there always be light searching for the dark matter for this we go out dark nights searching for the dimmest stars for signs of unseen things to weigh us down to stop the universe from rushing on and on into its own beyond till it exhausts itself and lies down cold its last star going out whatever they turn out to be let there be swarms of them enough for immortality always a star where we can warm ourselves let there be enough to bring it back from its own edges to bring us all so close we ignite the bright spark of resurrection anyone else to ask question hi ma'am what's your response to netflix removal of film annapurni even though it narrates the rich tamil culture of cuisines and food uh, removal of film annapurni from netflix yeah. what's your response to that even though it narrates beautifully a girl chasing her passion overcoming so many hurdles and it narrates a rich history of tamil food see this is a problem which comes with when people decide what should be said what should be eaten what is a right food what is a good cinema everything when there is zero freedom of expression uh i totally disapprove uh, of it and uh, it's very sad and i hope things will change as it should change
Anyone else to ask question? So I hope it's the end of the interactive session. And we all had a really fruitful interactive session. And ma'am inspired us with fresh perspectives about the lecture. So thank you, ma'am. Now it's time to welcome Dr. Ajit Kumarji, Festival Director of Global Science Festival Kerala, to give a token of love to our respected chief guest, Kanimori Karunanidhi, ma'am. Thank you. Now, I welcome Ms. Kirtana KS, Program Coordinator, GSFK, for the vote of thanks. Good evening, everyone. It's with great pleasure and heartfelt gratitude I stand before you to extend a vote of thanks following the insightful and inspiring session by our beloved chief guest. We have been truly privileged to have a, have a leader like her on the stage of GSFK. I express my deep, deepest gratitude to Srimadi Kanimuri Karunanthi MP on behalf of the entire team of Global Science Festival Kerala for sharing her wealth of knowledge with her. Thank you, ma'am. There was more to discuss than just science and literature. She spoke about everything in between. Human rights, social justice, human beliefs, philosophy, all of them. And above all, she re reiterated her stance once again on the stage. That's how she became the leader of common people. Because raising your voice for what you believe in is very important. And in this time, in our country, it's very important to have an opinion. Because your silence is also a statement. Thank you, ma'am, for your presence and the wonderful session. A heartfelt thank you is also extended to the chairperson of this session, Dr. Vaishagan Tambi. His guidance has been a beacon of light for us throughout the festival. We are truly grateful for your invaluable contributions. I would like to express our gratitude to Mr. V.S. Sham, who delivered the welcome speech, setting the tone of the event. He is an integral part of the festival and made the commencement of this event truly memorable. A special mention goes to Dr. Ajit Kumarji uh, for his contributions and guidance toward the event. We extend our gratitude to all the dedicated staff and volunteers working behind the scenes your contributions have not gone unnoticed because we as a team made this possible. Finally, our heartfelt thanks to uh, the everyone, the audience, everyone present here today, be it students, professionals, or science enthusiasts. Your presence has greatly enriched this event. Thank you for coming. And once again, I'm thanking you, thanking all of you on behalf of Team GSFK. Thank you, and that's all for today's session. Hope you all had a great time. Thank you.